So this class will be on whether or not the historicity of the New Testament is reliable. Alrighty. So other spoiler alert, it is. Alright, so you guys will have to forgive my formatting a little bit on the PowerPoint, okay? Because so the way this worked was at Door Baptist, when I put all this together, they use a square screen, okay? And I had a Mac. So I put this whole thing together on the square screen for a Mac. Well, I no longer have the Mac, but before I did, I exported all the files so that way I could keep them. But the problem is that it was too big of a file to email, so I had to upload it to Google Drive, which does not allow me to format it back to a wider screen. So you might have a harder time reading some of this, but don't worry, I'll read it for you. So, uh, you're welcome. I know you struggle with reading, Micah. <laughs> All righty. So now the reason why I'm going through this and last week, I appreciate you guys' patience as we had the leak and our circuit board was fried out and all sorts of fun stuff. So we last week in class, we reviewed the arguments for God's existence. We just did a quick cursory view of them just to kind of refresh your memory, because when we're talking about Christianity, you're arguing for two things, that God exists and that the New Testament is reliable, including the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, that is the central thing, right? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All Christianity, no matter what denomination, all hinges on that event, right? So now what we have to do, if we're going to properly defend our view is to properly defend the New Testament. We have to say that this is a reliable document, that what it's saying is true, and if what it is saying is true, we should listen to it and adhere to it. Now, this series is going to be a few weeks long. Each um, lesson is lengthy, so I'll try to get through it. Peace. Sorry, my wife might need to take the child out. Otherwise, you can run around the auditorium, so you have no problem with it. Hi. Okay. Big smiles. Good job. Okay. So with that being said, guys, we're going to ask some very simple questions that historians ask themselves. It's a historical method to know whether or not something is historically reliable. One of the first questions that we ask is, do we have eyewitness testimony of the claimed events? Do we have early testimony? In other words, do we have people who recorded this close to the event itself, right? Because if I'm going to write on, on the Revolutionary War now, you're, and I'll be like, oh man, I'm an expert, I know this. You would be like, okay, well, how do you know it? You're so far removed from the events. You weren't even able to talk to eyewitnesses, right? So, oh, and that would be rightfully skeptical. So we're going to ask that. We're also going to go through some other historical verifications Things like, do we have enemy attestation? Do we have people who are enemies of Christianity also attesting to the truth of the claims, right? Um, do we have people who, do we have embarrassing details of the people giving the testimony? Because if you're making up a great legend and story, you're probably going to want to make yourself come off pretty cool, right? We've all heard of a fabricated story before, right? That one kid at the party who always tells a bogus story that is entirely fabricated. He never makes himself embarrassing, does he? Right? So these are just questions that historians ask themselves when they're looking at historical documents. And one of the biggest issues with Christianity is the fact that we almost look at the Bible like a sacred text that fell from heaven. It's more than that. It's a living and breathing document that was written by people, various people, all throughout different ages. In fact... Um, I love the way uh, Jordan Peterson just described it as it's your Bible is a library. And that's really the best way to look at it. So with that being said, while we talk about the historical proofs of Jesus Christ, the question is we're going to explore right now is do we have eyewitness testimony? And that is an important question because if we do not have eyewitness testimony. We don't have much, do we? Simon Peter, the apostle, says this. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
So we have a strong claim by Peter here saying, I am an eyewitness of this. I saw this myself. So, and again, is he a zealot? Is he some crazy madman? Now, that's a good question to ask, but really what we have is he's a fisherman. Because one of the issues is that also these books are written about actual people who live and breathe. And one of the issues today, too, is that people seem to think that people in the first century and the four BCs, X, Y, Z, right, that these people were basically uneducated, really stupid cavemen who were ignorant and superstitious. That is an idea that seems to be prevalent today. However, these people weren't all that way. Actually, they weren't that different from you and me. They had jobs. They had families. Now, their house wasn't air-conditioned, right? But they lived, operated, had friends, went to service. They did the same things that you and I do today. They go to the market. They talk. They have conversations. They had philosophical and theological conversations, political conversations. In fact, there's a lot of political um, statements kind of hidden throughout the New Testament even. So... Now, again, like I said, the format is going to make it hard for you to read, but I'll go ahead and go through this. So the New Testament says that there are witnesses in the book of Acts of the Apostles, right? We call it Acts, but it's really Acts of the Apostles. Um, that always confused me as a kid. I'm like, Acts? Why do we call it Acts? And why is it like not an Acts, like with an X? Why is it Acts like I'm doing something? Who's doing anything? It's Acts of the Apostles. It's things that they do. Okay. So if you take the plain reading of the New Testament then there are definitely eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses of the accounts being claimed. In Acts 2.32, we see that um, Luke records this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Acts 3.15, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And you see similar language in Acts 4.18, 5.30-32, 10.39-40, 1 Corinthians 15.3-8, 1 Peter 5, one, 2 Peter 1.16, John 19.33-35, and on and on it could go. We have people claiming, I saw this take place. So now what we have to do is, are their claims legitimate, Right? Because if I, I mean, we all know, when you go into court and you say, I saw that man steal this, you are making a claim and your witness helps attest to the truth or falsehood of the accusation, right? So the idea is if you have multiple people from multiple different backgrounds all attesting to the same truth claim, there's probably some truth there, right? Right? Because all of us are all from different backgrounds, I'm assuming. And if everyone in this room is from different backgrounds and we all said we witnessed the same event, we have to ask the question, is what they say true? And most likely it is because we have more people claiming it, right? So it would seem that the writers at least definitely wanted people to know that they had seen something or they had at least thought they seen something, right? So New Testament witnesses, let's talk about Luke. Okay, let's talk about Luke for a second. Luke is arguably, I don't know if you know this, a lot of atheist historians have actually converted to Christianity because of the book of Luke and the book of Acts, which was also written by Luke. Okay, a lot of people have because as they were reading it, they saw accuracy after accuracy after accuracy. And they're like, okay, I have a hard time believing that 99% of what this guy says is 100% accurate. And what he's saying about the risen Jesus can't be accurate. Because this seems crazy because of how this, and if you read Luke, have you guys ever read maybe a portion of the Bible and you were like, my goodness, this is dry. Right? It's not colorful, floofy language. It's not written like Stephen King novel that drags you into the room. It's usually just like, yeah, there's a blind man sitting by the side of the road, and Jesus walked up and threw some mud on his eyes, and whoo, he can see. And you're just kind of like, just like that? And then he just moves on to the next event. That is actually a style of writing that helps us say it's historical. Because he's saying it matter-of-factly. He's just giving you point-by-point -point breakdowns. This happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. Like a court case. You know, you're just, these are the events, sir. You're writing a police report. 
So it actually helps us with the plain language of the New Testament. So Luke and the writer of Hebrews, and the author of Hebrews is very debated today. Many people think it's Paul. Some people think it's Apollos. Um, others think it could be someone else. So there's a lot of theories there. But um, personally, I don't think it was Paul because I think the writing style is different. But I could be wrong. I don't really care on this side of heaven. Okay. So um, Luke and the writer of Hebrews both claim to have interviewed Eyewitnesses. Now you have to remember Luke. Luke was a Gentile, right? He wasn't Jewish. He was a Gentile. So it's not like he even had any reason as a Gentile to take the Jewish Messiah seriously. We know he was not just a Gentile, but he was a physician, right? He was a doctor of his day. So he was educated and he wasn't Jewish. And now you have this educated, non Jewish person proclaiming the Jewish Messiah. That's interesting. What would give him why? Unless what he's saying is true. So Luke chapters 1 through 2, Luke says this. And as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as these were from the beginning, where eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. So, again, he makes the claim. Now, keep in mind, Luke is writing this because he's saying, hey, a lot of people have made claims about the New Testament, about the, not the New Testament, about these events, about this Jesus guy. Okay? So I write to you basically from the witnesses. Because essentially what we have, if you look at the route Luke takes, he's basically following behind the apostles where all these events are happening. and He's interviewing people. He's a physician. He's knowledgeable. So he's recording stuff. As you would, because if something huge happened in your culture that was splitting it down the middle, you would probably want to investigate that, right? Makes sense. Think about um, now all of a sudden these people are going on and on about this Jewish guy. People are getting, uh, Jew, Jewish guy, Jesus guy. Who was a Jewish guy? <laughs> They're going on about this guy. Some of these people are getting beaten and arrested even. You have this guy named Saul, Paul. Saul running around kicking down doors, killing people who proclaim this Jesus guy. Like, I better find out what's going on. So uh, Luke is saying, hey, these are the witnesses. I'm just going to tell you what they say. Hebrews 2, 3 through 4 says, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders, various miracles and gifts by uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So we have him again, this author saying, hey, there's some witnessing going on. So, the New Testament witnesses. We have Peter, who claims to be. We have Paul and John and all others claimed to be eyewitnesses of the events. What's unique is that Luke and the author of Hebrews claimed to be informed by the witnesses. So you have one person claiming, hey, all right, we are witnesses. These other ones are like, we interviewed witnesses. Make sense? Okay, which is good because it means that now we have, we have two different categories here. We don't just have people making claims. We have people making claims and people interviewing the claims. That's good, okay? So, one of the, and again, this, there's a reason why the New Testament exploded across the ancient world. Um, wait till you guys, as we go through this series, I'm going to show you guys a chart um, that's going to most likely drop your jaws because it, I know I did. Um, so, anyway... Paul specifically lists 14 people whose names are known as eyewitnesses. 12 apostles. He mentions James. He also mentions Paul himself. And then he mentions also a crowd of 500 witnesses. They make claims in front of people who confirm it as true. They also make bold proclamations to powerful people. One of the things that people miss when studying the New Testament is consider this. If I came to you and I said, guys, last week was crazy. I sat down with Barack Obama and had a beer with him. 
Yeah, I want to be like, wow, an old president of the United States. Did you guys argue the whole time on politics? Will, I know you're a libertarian. How was that? But then you go on Google and you find out, well, Will was in Michigan because he doesn't go anywhere. And Barack Obama was like out in freaking D.C. somewhere at some political rally. Well, then you'd go, Will's full of crap, right? Right? Because I made a serious claim about a public figure. Why don't we have the same common sense view when we look at the New Testament? This is one of those areas that has changed many atheist historians. Because Paul is getting in front of actual political leaders. This, these letters are circulating, talking about we sat with this person, we talked to this person, political leaders, uh, governors of their, their respective cities, standing on trial. And no one said they were wrong. They never said that these events never took place, which means that there's some validity there, right? Because th these letters wouldn't circulate the way they did. They would have been squashed because it would have been so hilariously absurd at the lie. Instead, it keeps building and building and spreading and spreading, which is why the Roman Empire and the Jews both found it a threat because they couldn't stop it. <laughs> so that's important to understand. Plus, if you're like, hey, by the way, so the 12 apostles is James guy, I, Paul, myself, and then 500 other people all bore witness to the uh, risen Jesus, that's a big claim. So what Paul is saying is don't take my word for it. Other people affirm it. He's calling in witnesses as testimony. That's important because what was Paul? He was a first century Jewish Pharisee. And I know in church today you say Pharisee and everyone goes, ooh, right? They're the bad guys. But what we don't realize is that to be a Pharisee, you basically had to have a PhD in Jewish theology. Okay? You were highly educated. So educated, you should, and also Paul was, had Roman citizenship, which is very rare for Jewish people to have, which meant he was wealthy. So he comes from a place of privilege, wealth, and intelligence, and education. Okay? He's awesome. He is a very influential person with that, that capability. So with Paul having these claims, what does a Jewish Pharisee say? Well, what, how does the Torah work? In the presence of up to two witnesses, you need to verify your case before the judges, right? The Sadducees. So why do you think Paul's like, all right, here are my witnesses. By the way, I don't have two. I have many, over 500. So that's why sometimes I think we were so divorced from the first century uh, Jewish culture that we miss some of the reasons why some of these things are here. Yeah. He's calling it in as evidence. Okay. Now, for example... Paul has an exchange with the governor of Festus in Acts 26, verses 24 through 28. And as he was saying those things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. <laughs> your, your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. He flatters him a little bit. I like that. But I am speaking true and rational words. For the king knows about these things. And to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? This... King Agrippa is a huge historical figure, a public figure, a well-known figure. And of course, the <laughs> Festus is like, man, you're out of your mind. You've gone mad. And all your learned education, you're, you, you're just, you snapped. <laughs> okay? It's like an H.P. Lovecraft novel where suddenly the truth made him go insane. Um, <laughs> and he's going, no, I'm speaking boldly here. I'm speaking truthfully. Basically, you might not like it. But what does the king say? Would you, could you, in a short period of time, persuade me to become a Christian? In other words, he says, make your case. So we have Paul standing before public figures in public court, making a case about this, claiming witnesses. It's important. 
Do you see how this is important? Because the, the book of Acts does not exist in a vacuum. It has historical context to it. Okay? And this is a historical claim. It's written by Luke. It's written by a Gentile. He's not even Jewish. <laughs> and he's writing, if you read the beginning of Acts and Luke, he's writing to some dude named Theophilus. We have no idea who Theophilus is, by the way. There's a lot of theories, and, but that's, that's about it. So now we have the people in the New Testament were not afraid to challenge their hearers to test their testimony. That's important, because if you were making something up, wouldn't you not want them to look too deeply? Right? I know I wouldn't. Instead, you'd come up with your story and then try to be like, distract, distract, distract. Don't look into it. Don't, don't. Right? If you, if, you were ever, if you were a sly kid growing up, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was really good at it. Um, but anyway, so we have New Testament witnesses. Peter also does the same, by the way, in Acts 5, 27 to 32. He does the same thing in front of a, a public figure. Okay. So now the question is, were they really eyewitnesses? Right? We have them claiming to be, but were they? And by the way, what I'm doing here, what I'm going through, I should have mentioned this before, I'm bringing you guys the questions that actual historians have asked with the actual evidence that has cropped up on, from New Testament scholars. So this isn't just the word of will. This is people from Dr. Gary Habermas to Dr. Mike Lycona, um, all leading scholars of the New Testament. There are some detractors like Dr. Bart Ehrman, but Dr. Bart Ehrman brings up some things that have already been addressed by other people like Lycona or Dr. Lydia McGrew. Uh, she is fantastic too, by the way. And also they're like right in Kalamazoo. Fun fact. It was like one of the things I was looking up, like, wait, he teaches philosophy at what university? <gasps> they're 45 minutes away. Then I had a little fanboy attack, but it's fine. All right. Um, <laughs> So were they really eyewitnesses? What evidence do we have that these writers are even telling the truth? That is a perfectly fair question. So now we have eyewitness of Luke. So in the second half of Acts, okay, second half of Acts, Luke proves that he has an in-depth knowledge of local places, names, environmental conditions, customs, leaders, and circumstances. You guys ever, have you ever read it where he's like, oh, and the, and the water was this deep and we were going to X, Y from this and then we were going on this route and you're like, why does this matter? Get to the good stuff. Well, guys, nowadays that is the good stuff that helps you defend your faith. Yeah. Okay. Classical scholar and historian Colin Hamer pours over Luke's accuracy in his writings verse by verse. And he, one scholar has identified 84 facts in the last 16 chapters of Acts that have been confirmed by historical and archaeological research. That's just one half, by the way. Just throwing that out there. Now, you guys will be able to read this. And if you can, I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> Brandon's like, I'm a poor college student. I got this. <laughs> All right. So here's... Here are some of the facts. I'm only going to share 16 of the 84. We have the best shipping lanes at the time in 27.5. We have the common bonding of Cilicia and Pamphylia. We have the principal port to find a ship sailing to Italy and the slow passage to, uh, or to Nidus in the face of the typical northwest wind. We have a route, a, the right route to sail in view of the winds. We have the location of fair havens and neighboring sites of Lycia. We have fair havens as poorly sheltered roadsteads, a noted tendency of a south wind in, the, uh, in these climes to back suddenly to a violent storm, the well-known Grigel. The nature of a square-rigged ancient ship having no option but to be driven ashore by the gale. We have a precise place and name of a particular island. We have the appro appropriate maneuvers for the safety of the ship in its particular plight. We have 14th, the 14th night, a remarkable calculation based inevitably actually on a compounding of estimates and probabilities confirmed in the judgment of experienced Mediterranean navigators. 
That's a mouthful. Um, the proper term of the time for the Adriatic, we have the precise term, which is balasantes, for taking the soundings and the correct depths of the water near Malta, and a position that suits the probable line of approach of a ship and release to run before an easterly wind, and the severe liability on guards who permitted a prisoner to escape. And that's just 16 of 84. I could keep going. And it, well, well, <laughs> it's just, go. But the point is here, it is, one might say, dripping with historical truth, mm-hmm. right? And so now one has to ask, is he so accurate where he gets the proper water depth, but he can't get a proper event taken care of? Like he gets that all wrong? And this is where historic, historians have really gone He seems like he's really trying to do his due diligence as a historian. In fact, many have claimed that he is the greatest historian of his day, or at least one of. So, what more could Luke have done to prove his authenticity as a historian? It's a good question. What else could he do? I'm giving you as specific of details as humanly possible as I'm chasing this whole story down. What more could he do? It's kind of like, have you ever talked to somebody and they have some drama in the family, maybe somebody wronged them, and then that person who wronged them goes, I'm so sorry for my sin or whatever I've done against you, blah, 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 would you please forgive me? And then the other person goes, that's not good enough. Have you ever heard somebody do that? And then the next question, of course, rightly is, what more can they do besides admit fault, right? Well, in the same situation, what more can he do than give you details? (laughs) So this was just the eyewitness testimony of Luke, by the way. That's just one guy. So, and Sherwin White, a Roman historian, says this. For Acts, the confirmation of historicity is overwhelming. Any attempt to reject its basic historicity must now appear absurd. Roman historians have long taken it for granted. Because he's saying to deny it is silly. It's so plainly obvious, right? So, let's talk about skeptics who investigated Luke's writings. So we have William M. Ramsey. He began his dive into Acts with great skepticism, right? Not a believer. This is what he said. I began with a mind unfavorable unfavorable to it. I did not lie then in my line of life to investigate the subject minutely. But more recently, I found myself often brought into contact with the book of Acts as an authority for the topography, antiquities, and and society of Asia Minor. It was gradually borne in upon me that in various details, the narrative showed marvelous truth. He goes on, because it was these details that led Ramsey to say these words. Luke's history is unsurpassed in respect of its trustworthiness. And he also says, Luke is a historian of the highest rank. He should be placed among, I mean, along with the very greatest of historians. But remember, it's just a fairy tale. Now, Let's talk about a skeptical dilemma for those who would reject it. So this poses a real problem for skeptics, atheists, and the like. For many skeptics and deniers, in the same book where Luke cites 84 confirmed historical facts, he also includes 35 miracles. Well, now we're in a pickle. (laughs) Just some of them are recorded in Acts 13, 11, 14, 8, 16, 18, 9, 11 through 19, 11 through 20, 29 through 10, and 28, 8 through 9. All these miracles are recorded in the same narrative as the 84 points. These miracle accounts show no signs of embellishment. They are told in the same efficacy as the rest of the historical narrative. So in other words... When he just played and he goes, water was this deep, wind goes this way, this is the route we take because of blah, blah, blah. When he just says it, he does the same exact method when he's like, yep, heal the blind man, did this, heal the cripple. Well, now you have to ask, is he full of crap or is he completely accurate? 
Good questions. So, all these miracles are recorded, right? So why would Luke be so accurate with trivial details, such as wind directions, water depths, town names, political leaders, but not accurate when it comes to miracle claims? Doesn't make a lot of sense. So, eyewitness testimony. Acts to Luke. We've now established the historicity of Acts, but what of the Gospel of Luke? Because the Gospel of Luke is where we have, you know, the resurrection. Acts and Luke are actually highly related books. Both contain the exact same vocabulary and literary style. Both books address themselves to most excellent Theophilus, which, by the way, from here on out, I want to be referred to as the most excellent Will Hess. Um... Likely a Roman official, since this phrase is used by Paul when addressing Felix and Festus. Because when he talked to most excellent Festus, most excellent Felix, so most likely he's talking to some sort of official, right? That's about as much as we got on the guy. So, I would assess only Acts to Luke. Can we trust the account of Luke as the as same as Acts? We can, sit, we can, though, since there is nothing that actually appears to state otherwise. In fact, Luke himself says in verse 3 of Luke, It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Again, he's saying, I'm hunting the story down. Okay, I'm gonna, don't worry, I'll try to figure it out for you. Which is great. And I can't tell you how important it is that we have a Gentile who's not Jewish doing this. Because if it was just a bunch of Jews, it just come off like a bunch of radical zealots, right? A bunch of religious nut jobs making up a story for power or something, right? So, it's very important that we have Luke. So, I got some time. All right, we'll keep moving. All right, eyewitness testimony, Acts to Luke. In the book of Luke, he names 12 historically confirmed leaders. So, a similar pattern as before. These include Herod the Great, Caesar Augustus, Quirinius, and Pontius Pilate. These are huge names, by the way. So again, if you're making claims about these guys, you better be accurate or else they will find out, they will find you, and they will kill you, right? They have a particular set of skills, like Liam. Anyway. <laughs> if he was being fictitious, he would be putting himself in great danger making false claims about these leaders back then, wouldn't he? I mean, we may come up with names now and it gets a little, I mean, if we come up with stuff now, it can get a little hairy. Back then, it could kill you, yeah. right? So you don't usually want to make untrue claims. Now, F.F. F. Bruce said this, a writer who thus relates his story to the wider context of world history is courting trouble if he is not careful. He affords his critical readers so many opportunities for testing his accuracy. Luke takes this risk and stands the test admirably. All 12 leaders, by the way, that he mentions in the book of Luke have been confirmed by non-Christian writers or by archaeology. So it's not something you just have to take a bunch of Christians' word for granted. John the Baptist is also mentioned, fun fact, by Josephus, who is a Jewish historian who sided with Rome. In other words, he's not a friend to Christianity. Inscription dating uh, at A.D. 14 through 29 bears also the, the name Lysania as well, okay? And in a good book that I, I think I recommended at the beginning of us doing this for a brief overview of the defense of Christianity is I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. But he said, in this book it says this, Norman Geisler um, said, since Luke is telling the truth, then so are Mark and Matthew because their gospels tell the same basic story. This is devastating to skeptics, but the logic is inescapable. You need a lot of faith to ignore it. Huh. So, hence why I don't have faith to be an atheist, right? It's a little catchphrase. It's fun, fun, fun. Oh, it's a fun zinger. Not really. It's a good rhetorical power. Not going to help you in an argument, though. <laughs> but it's true because you have to think. If Luke is saying this, and Mark and Matthew make the same claims, who's to say that they were wrong? Because Luke is pretty stinking accurate. It's going to take a lot of faith for me to ignore that. This is why I say all the time that people have faith no matter what. Yep. The question is, what is your faith in? Like, what do you believe? We all believe in something we didn't witness ourselves, right? All of us do. Like, you know, if you believe in an accidental singularity that exploded, Big Bang by itself, 
created all things through billions of years through a single-celled organism and it was all an accident. You didn't witness any of that. You are literally taking that out on faith, right? The question is, what do, you have, what, what do we believe, right? So, where am, I at? where am I at in here? All right, I'll stop here in a minute. So a historian who has, found tr- who has been found trustworthy where he or she can be tested, should be given the benefit of the doubt in cases where no tests are available. That's what Craig Lomberg said. And I think this is true, right? Like if someone is making as ac- all these accurate things, all these accurate statements up to that point, and then they say some things that you can't necessarily verify yet, you should at least be charitable, right? Mm-hmm. Kind of like if you're talking to your child, okay? And your child's telling you an entire account that happened, you know, these two, they, your kids got in a fight with another kid. Your kid comes to you, he tells you a bunch of stuff. You see evidence for even six, let's say, of ten claims. Well, then I think four of those claims you can be charitable usually to your child and think that, okay, that's, he's probably telling the truth, right? Because you can start, start breaking that down a little bit. Like, oh, let's be charitable. And then you have to also ask yourself, what motive would they have to lie? Right? In fact, isn't that a big thing in court cases? Who has a bigger reason to lie? It's a good question. Um, so, whoops, we'll, let's go back up. And so, yeah, there we go. So, because it is about noon, we'll go ahead and start wrapping this up. We'll talk about the. We'll talk about John next week. We're going to be talking about eyewitnesses for probably a week or another week or two. Okay. But the thing, point is here. So you have to ask yourself, why would someone lie? Uh, one of the biggest questions now, uh, one of the biggest things that people say now is a bunch of religious propaganda back then. Even some of the atheist scholars say religious propaganda. Uh, are you guys familiar with the big YouTubers, uh, Rhett and Link? Good Mythical Morning? Okay, all right. They're hilarious. Unfortunately, a couple years ago, they left the faith. And, he, and they even said after they re- did all this reading, they can't help but view the New Testament as religious propaganda. And when you listen to both their like two hour episodes talking about their deconstruction of faith, it brought, I mean, it was, it was a gut punch. I mean, I'm listening to this and it was, it was tough to listen to. Um, I did, we did a, Brian and I did a little chat about it. Um, but the thing is, is you have to ask, why would they lie? Because it didn't get you, this religious propaganda didn't get them power. It didn't give them privilege. It didn't get them control. It got them killed. Look at what happened to Christians during that time. They were thrown in Colosseums by Nero, ripped apart by lions. These people were murdered for their faith. It didn't give them anything besides heartache. I mean, in fact, Saul went from a guy who loved killing Christians (laughs) to defending them and proclaiming and becoming the greatest New Testament writer most people are familiar with. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? You have to ask motive when we're going through things historically. So I think that's important. But um, with that being said, do we have any quick comments? I've been lecturing. So comments, questions, insults? Nothing? Either I'm the most thorough teacher on planet Earth or y'all fell asleep. I guess we're going with the latter. Okay. What was that, Micah? The skip of so anyway, yes, sir. Yes, most excellent. Thank you. Address me as, as proper. Thanks. So just a question in my head. How would you answer, like, you know, we say that the, the best lie is a total lie, but the most true is a little lie. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so Luke made all this accuracy, right? Mm-hmm. That's actually a good point, right? So most, uh, for those who could not hear the question, Brian asked, but the best lies contain basically 90% truth and 10% falsehood, right? So how do you get around that? How do we not know that Luke is making up, you know, really accurate, but then fudging the other numbers, so to speak? And I think that's where some of the questions that we're asking comes in. We have to ask why, what's his motive? What would he gain from it? You know, um, I think those are really important because Luke, like all the other people, did not live, die a pretty death. You know, you have also you have Peter who was crucified upside down and you have uh, other people who were thrown and torn apart and 
beheaded, Paul being beheaded, um, because he claimed that he had an encounter with the risen Jesus. So I think you have to start, and these are things that, it's not just biblical, like it's not just biblical authors, other people have confirmed it. So then you have to, so I think one of the biggest things is motive. I have no reason to believe that somebody would be that crazy, especially that many. Like maybe one, right? Like Muhammad, right? You had one dude who's like, no, no, really, I get direct revelation from Allah. Just take my word for it and don't look into it. <laughs> um, same thing with um, Joseph Smith with the Mormonism. You have one guy who's, say, who's making claims. What we have in Christianity is something very unique, which is we have a lot of people making a lot of claims and willing to die for it. And you, most people don't die for a lie that they claim they saw as eyewitness, right? Now, most people, a lot of people die for a lie when it comes to something that they religiously believe. You know, 9-11 is a great example of that uh, because they believed it, but it's been passed on, passed on, passed on, and indoctrinated. Whereas here we have, no, no, I, I saw it. I'm not going to recant. It's very different. Um, and this is why the New Testament, even uh, among skeptics, is so fascinating for them because they can't figure it out. Because if they were to admit its claims, they would have to... Uh, move away from their skepticism. So I think there is a, a motive there uh, as to why some people won't accept it. But I think asking about the motive of the writers and the claim, people who are making claims is important. Um, was it Ignatius, I believe, one of the early church fathers? I think he, I do not quote me, I'm going pure from memory right now. So this could be, the story is accurate. I, do, I wanna say he was a, a disciple of Peter, I believe. Don't quote me, Ignatius of Antioch. Look him up. <laughs> okay. But he was martyred. And one of the things that he did, I mean, he was brought into, the, the whole account is recorded where they, he was asked to recant his faith as an 80-year-old 80 like 80 man. And he was like, Christ has never betrayed me. None of my faith has ever done me wrong. Do what you will. They're like, no, recant. He's like, mm, no. And they're like, well, the lions will tear you apart. He's like, I hope they eat every morsel of my body so that way every part of me can be given to martyrdom for Christ. And then they're like, well, he is not afraid of the lions. We'll burn you. And he's like, very good, because the fires of earth are nothing compared to the fires of hell. And I will go up my spirit to Jesus. And they're like, I, this guy's insane. Like, and he, I mean, it's crazy. I was reading it and I was like, this guy is, I mean, he's like looking at it, like the, the, the description so good. But basically he's just standing in front of the Roman official going, do your worst. And I just have a hard time believing that all these things keep happening by early believers just because they wanted to make it up. You know, it's like, it's pretty, the consequences are pretty high column. Do you think their uh, testimony about themselves factors into that as well? The disciples' testimony about themselves? What, which part? Well, like, uh, how they're all afraid and the ocean, well, sorry, not the ocean. Yes. The Sea of Galilee or... Absolutely. Yes, which we're, that's in, uh, we're actually going to cover that a little bit in here with top 10 reasons we know. And one of that is embarrassing details. Um, I can give you a snippet here, but when, after Jesus was killed, what were his most devoted followers who were one Peter claimed, Christ, I will die for you. I will go down to the grave with you. No one will be able to touch you unless they get through me, right? Well, they're scared and they're hiding in a, in a little house and terrified out of their wits. Meanwhile, women were the ones who first testified the risen Christ. And we're going to get sexist here for two seconds. But in the first century, women's testimony was not considered that great. So it's a very embarrassing detail, right? Because if you're trying to fabricate a story, who would be the ones to discover Jesus? Well, it would be Peter, James, and John, of course. We're the most loyal. We're the most well-known. We found him and oh, there he was in all his glory. No, no, we were horrified and scared and hiding. And the women actually were the ones who found him. So take that or leave it, you know? So I think that all those things play a major role in confirming whether or not it's true. So we'll get to that too as well. Cool. I like this. Engaging.